Did you know that before light was even created, that God had actually created water? This is something that I had never really realized until I was studying for this lesson. But if you turn with me to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, we all know this verse as it starts out and, and it is, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. It continues on, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. You see, God had created water from the very beginning, even so to the point that before he said, let there be light on the first day, water was already there on the earth. That struck me as fascinating, and it, it's really something about telling us about the significance or the importance of water. You know, God created all of the earth, and he created all of the elements of the earth. And in various ways, the different elements of the earth can actually teach us about his character and can teach us about who he is and about his divine power and his divine nature. Water is one of those that he uses throughout scriptures to teach us about his power. Consider the fact that even now as we look around the world, we see that two-thirds of the earth is covered in water. It must be an important thing. Also, not only that, but two-thirds of the human adult body is filled with water. It's a, a fascinating thing. And then not only that, but water has life-giving properties. If we go for two to three days without water, we can't sustain our lives. It's such an important substance that God had created. You know, not only that, but throughout Scripture, God uses water in a special kind of way to demonstrate His power. Many of the miracles recorded throughout Scripture had something to do with water. You know, this is perhaps just speculation, but um, water has somewhat unique properties. Of course, we all know water um, because we all need water. Water is a liquid, and the majority of what we have and we interact with on a day-to-day -day basis are solid objects, but not water. Water is different. It has different characteristics and different laws of physics concerning it. And so perhaps that's the reason that God uses it to demonstrate how he is able to bend that very law of nature that he set into motion it can demonstrate his power. Think about how he turned, uh, Jesus turned water into wine. That's something that God used water to demonstrate something that was impossible to happen to demonstrate his divine power. Think about, he also turned water to blood in the ten plagues in, in Exodus. Jesus walked on water, something that is physically impossible to do because it's not a solid object. I think about the story of Gideon and the fleece as well. When Gideon on one day laid out the fleece on the, on the ground and said, if the fleece is wet but the ground is dry, then I'll know that it's, it's your doing, Lord. And then the inverse of that was true as well. Um, and that proved God's divinity and that Gideon was to listen to God and to trust in God. Then I also think of one other um, just that, that comes to mind is that when God had great victory over Baal on Mount Carmel. Consider that story as Elijah is pouring water all over the sacrifice that is to be burnt up. He pours this water and drenches this sacrifice and the, and the altar to the point that if God sent down fire to burn that sacrifice up, it must be only something that God can do. There's great power in water. But despite all of that, the most important thing that God teaches us is that water is necessary for salvation. Before I jump into that too far, uh, I want to talk about a couple of common errors in doctrine or in thinking that are, are very prevalent. One of those being that we are saved by grace only. And to that, I, I, I point out the word only because we are saved by grace. However, we're not saved by grace void of our personal responsibility to God. This is a, a common sort of misunderstanding or misinterpretation or sometimes a, an inaccurate defining of the word faith. 
Um, a lot of times, and, and I don't want to necessarily spend too much on this of just giving you a definition of faith, because through the lesson, I think we're going to be showing a definition of faith as we look through historical stories. Um, but faith is not just simply a belief. Faith is something that requires personal responsibility and action on our part. However, I want to point out that the other side of this equation is also an error. If we think that it's only our actions that can actually do anything for us in regards to salvation, then we're also missing the boat. Because it's not about our works. It's not about what we do that can earn salvation, because that would essentially do that to the neglect of God's grace. But you see, there is a merging of the two, and that is that when our faith is coupled with our obedience, that allows us to come in contact with God's grace. That's the point we're going to be proving as we look at several stories, and I know that's an aside from our discussion of water, but what we're going to see is these stories where someone is saved by water, or they're saved when they get through the water. So our sermon this morning is entitled, Salvation is on the Other Side of Water. And the point we're going to be looking at throughout is that God's grace does not rule out our need for precise obedience, but also good works without God's grace can never save us either. God's word gives us historic examples that use water to teach us these principles. And in all these examples, salvation is on the other side of water. So that being said, let's look at our first example. And that is Noah and the flood. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 6. And in the story of Noah and the flood, we can be certain that God's grace played a big part. We see in verses 7 and 8. It says, so the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. And then in verse 8, it says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You see, there was great wickedness in Noah's generation, and the world around him was full of wickedness. However, Noah found grace. Let's continue looking at this story and figure out how was it that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord? Well, Noah had a personal responsibility in order to bring about his salvation. As we continue reading on in that story in verse 13, we see that he's given specific instructions of how to build the ark. He's given instructions to use gopher wood. He's given instructions to cover it inside and outside with pitch. He's given particular dimensions with which to build the ark and places to put windows and places to not put windows. And he's given all these specific instructions. And then he's told, bring two of every animal. And then not only that, but take food for all to eat that you may have food for the animals and for your family. So he's given all these very particular instructions. So I ask you this. If God gave him particular instructions of using gopher wood, for instance, had he chosen to say, I think oak is a better wood that I'm going to use for this ark and build it that way, or I'm going to build it smaller or bigger, or if he's going to change the dimensions or whatever he chooses to change God's instructions, I would say that it does not seem that he would be taking up his personal responsibility and doing as the Lord said. But Noah demonstrates his specific obedience in that everything that God commanded that he do, he did. If we continue on there in Genesis chapter 6, verse 22, it says, Thus Noah did according to all that God commanded him, so he did. And that same sentiment is repeated in the next chapter in verse 5 as well. Noah did according to all that God commanded him. You see, Noah followed God's plan specifically. Had Noah decided to follow his own plan, he would not have found salvation through water. But Noah's obedient faith accessed God's grace. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, a lot of times we refer to it as 
the Faith's Hall of Fame. And that is because as we go through the chapter, we see example after example of Bible characters that demonstrated their faith through action. Every one of these examples shows us a character and says, by faith, and then talks about something that they did. And in this case, in verse 7, it says, By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, that is the flood, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. You see, it was Noah's obedient faith and his specific obedience to God's instructions that allowed him to be saved on the other side of water. Once again, Genesis chapter 7 and verse 1 says, Then the Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. As we go through these stories, pay particular attention to uh, a various subtlety of grace and action. And what I want to point out is, as we look at God's grace, a lot of times through the stories, we'll see that God will have a verb describing something that He is doing. And if it's something that God is doing, then we can consider it God's grace. For instance, if, if it says that the Lord saved Noah through water, then that's something that God is doing. That's God's grace being bestowed upon Noah. But then also we see that faithful obedience when a person is taking action to demonstrate their faith and obedience to God. So I want to point that out to, to notice that subtle difference as we go throughout. But here we see that the Lord saved Noah from this generation. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 20 um, talks about that Noah and his family were saved through water. And Noah and his family reached a new world on the other side of the water. And to them at that time, that was their salvation. The rest of the world was wiped out with utter destruction in the flood, but Noah and his family had salvation on the other side of the water. Let's look at another Bible example of characters being saved on the other side of the water. So we have Israel at the Red Sea. Having just departed Egypt, they're going on their journey away from Egypt, trying to escape the clutches of Pharaoh and his army. And they come to the Red Sea, a place that is impassable. And they look at the water ahead of them and are concerned that they won't be able to escape because of the water where they're trapped. But God's grace saved Israel. Exodus chapter 14 and verse 30. Turn with me there. Exodus chapter 14 and verse 30. Where it says, So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. Once again, pay particular attention to what the verb is describing or who is performing the action here. The Lord saved Israel that day. It wasn't something that Israel did. It was something that the Lord did. That God's grace was on Israel that day. We could also look at Psalm 106, 6-10 through 10, that describes that more in detail of them being saved through the Red Sea. But it once again shows us that God saved Israel that day. But God didn't do it entirely on His own. God did not simply pick up the nation of Israel hover them to the other side of the water, and they were saved. It didn't happen that way. God did not do all of that for them. He gave them specific instructions. In this, in this chapter, Exodus 14, in verses 15 and 16, we see in verse 15 specific instructions, God telling Moses to tell the children of Israel to go forward. You see, when the water was spread out on the left and the right, and there was dry ground. Think about the intimidation factor. This is a picture I got off the internet, but just look at that and imagine yourself looking at that water, thinking, I'm not going to go in there. That would take a great deal of faith 
to walk in and to go forward. Because that's something that no one had seen before. But then also in verse 16, we see specific instructions given to Moses. It says, but lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And then verse 21, once they're on the other side, Moses stretched, out his, Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind. So God allowed that water to part when Moses followed that instruction. And then in verse 22, um, we see that they enter in. So here we have faithful obedience once again that's allowing them to access God's grace. Go back with me to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 29. It says, By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. By faith they passed through the Red Sea. It took a great deal of faith to carry out that action and to cross the Red Sea. You see, instructions were given Obedience was required, and then faith in action was demonstrated, and their deliverance was on the other side of the water, as the water came crashing down on the Egyptians. What an impactful story that demonstrates salvation on the other side of the water. Another story I want to look at is Naaman. And we've just recently studied this in our Bible classes, but Naaman was a Syrian soldier and a Syrian commander, and Naaman had a skin disease. He had the disease of leprosy. Now this was something that was debilitating in the time because it was, had social implications, and it had health implications and longevity implications. This was a terrible disease that really took someone out of their normal way of life. And you see, God's grace saved Naaman. How do we know that? Well, turn with me to Luke chapter 4 and verse 27. It says there, And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet. And none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. You see, in the New Testament, it talks about this story of Naaman being cleansed of his leprosy. And it points out that Naaman was not, by any stretch, was he the only leper in the day of Elisha the prophet. There were many lepers in the day of Elisha the prophet, but only Naaman was cleansed. That shows us that God had given his grace to Naaman. Then turn with me to that account in 2 Kings in chapter 5. 2 Kings in chapter 5. You see... Naaman approached Elisha the prophet and was going to ask Elisha the prophet for help with his leprosy and with his skin condition. He had heard great things that Elisha and the former Elijah were able to do, and he wanted some of those blessings for himself. He wanted to be cleansed of his leprosy because of the terrible nature of leprosy. But what he found very quickly when he approached Elisha is that his personal responsibility was required. Verse 9 talks about him going to Elisha. Then in verse 10, Elisha sent a messenger out to him and said, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. Naaman's immediate reaction is very striking. The very next verse, verse 11, Naaman became furious. And he went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, He will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. What did Naaman expect going to see Elisha? He expected that Elisha would just come down, wave his hand, and poof, the leprosy would be gone. He had very high expectations, thinking that he had no personal responsibility that would allow for him to be cleansed of his leprosy. So he's furious. Much of the same today occurs when we think that grace only 
is something that saves us. That simply just acknowledging God and not actually taking any action upon ourselves is what saves us. It's a common, common thought today that, that grace only is something that, that will save us from our sins and help us to find salvation. But what do we see here? It wasn't just something where El- that Elisha would come out and wave his hand and, and cleanse Naaman of his leprosy. You know, I, I think his second reaction, Naaman's second reaction, is just as striking. Continue on with me in verse 12. He says, Are not the Abana and the Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be clean? So he turned away and went away in a rage. So first of all, he says, I wanted to have Elisha just come and wave his hand and cure me of my leprosy. Then the second thing that he says is the Jordan River. Look at the dirty waters of the Jordan River. Aren't the, uh, the rivers in Damascus, which is his hometown of Syria, aren't those rivers much cleaner? He wanted to change the instructions of God. What would have happened if he followed that thought? And he changed the instructions of God and he, and he went and dipped in the Abana or the Farpar rivers and he dipped seven times. He almost did it exactly as God would have instructed him to do. But he changed one element of it. Would he have been cleansed of his leprosy? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But, regardless of his initial reactions, what did he do? His obedient faith was demonstrated because in verse 14, he went and did exactly as Elisha had told him to do. He went and he dipped in seven times in the Jordan, and after he did so, his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. You see, there was healing on the other side of the water for Naaman. Had Naaman chosen to do it his own way and say he went to dip in the Jordan River just one time and then he left, would he have been cleansed of his leprosy? Absolutely not. If we change the commandments of God today and we want to make it our own plan and follow after our own uh, plan for salvation, likewise we will not find salvation on the other side of water as Naaman was able to. Another story to talk about is the man born blind. Turn with me to John chapter 9. John chapter 9. And verse 11 says, A man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and I received sight. There was a man born blind, and he was able to find Jesus. And Jesus had given him specific instructions here to to go after Jesus took water and mud and mixed it together and put it on his eyes. This man was given instructions to go and wash in the pool of Siloam. And he did so and was able to restore his sight. But Jesus was the one that anointed his eyes. It was an action of a divine being, Jesus, that allowed him to come into contact with this grace. But if you notice, likewise, as every other story we've looked at, there was a personal responsibility required. Jesus gave this man specific instructions to go to a particular pool and wash in the pool of Siloam and to do so and he would have his sight restored. This man obeyed specifically those instructions and his obedient faith allowed him access to God's grace. Verse 15 says, Then the Pharisees also, they were questioning this man after the fact, The Pharisees asked him again how he had received his sight, and he said to them, He put clay on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. You see, once again, it's specific obedience, and an obedient faith that allowed this man to access the healing and the sight that was on the other side of the water. 
So that's a quick look at these stories. I want to talk about one more thing, and that is the sinner and his salvation today. Because likewise, the sinner and his salvation follows a very, very similar pattern to all these stories that we've looked at. And that is that God's grace saves man from sin. Turn with me. This is a, a, a good text here in Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 5 and 8. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 5 tells us, Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. Points us out there that grace is our way of salvation. Because without grace, we're hopeless. We have no hope without the grace given to us by God. But then also our personal responsibility. Actually, I meant to talk on verse 8 as well. It tells us there, For grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Once again, grace is our means of salvation. But absolutely also, our personal responsibility is required. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 9 tells us, And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. So we're starting, as we harmonize these scriptures together, we see that it, is our, that it is grace from God that gives us salvation, but it's also those who obey Him that find salvation. And then Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21, God tells us specifically, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. So you see, there is a personal responsibility required to us finding that salvation and coming in contact with the grace of God. So what is our personal responsibility? And how do we show our obedient faith in order to access God's grace? A few more verses, and and the lesson will be yours this morning. But the answer to that, in part, is baptism. Mark chapter 16 and verse 16 tells us, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Baptism is something that shows our obedient faith. Now that's a simple action. Um, Back in that story of Naaman, when Naaman had complaints about the, the river's that he did not want to go dip in the Jordan River, he had company that was with him that told him, this is not a hard thing to do. And they encouraged him to go do it. Baptism, similarly, is not a hard thing to do. It's something that is, is, is an action of ours that we choose to be baptized, but that allows us to come into contact with grace, and that is a demonstration of our faith, a demonstration of our belief in Christ. And then also... Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, another verse that points us to baptism as a way of showing our obedient faith. And then Peter said to them in this verse, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. A moment ago I said in part baptism is something that shows our obedient faith, and that is that not baptism alone Um, shows our obedient faith, but yet there is other components of this as well. That is belief in Christ, confession of that belief. And then this verse here tells us repentance and being baptized. You see, these are ways that we show our obedient faith. And then 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. Turn with me there to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. And even backing up to, to verse 20, we'll read there as this uh, harkens back to the story of Noah that we've already discussed. It says, "...who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water." So Noah and his family were saved through water. And then pay attention where verse 21 goes, and it says, "...there is also now an antitype which saves us." baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh. You see, it's not just a washing away of the dirt on our bodies, but it's the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Just as Noah 
and his family were saved through water. We are saved through water. You see, the scriptures show us this pattern that an obedient faith using water and making it to the other side of the water is how we find our salvation. You see, faith is not just simply a belief. It's not simply just a belief in Jesus, but it's a belief that calls us to action. It's a belief that calls us to have personal responsibilities. And that when we do act on our faith and we act on our belief, it demonstrates that obedient faith to us. That specific obedience that we follow. You see, baptism is what we are commanded to do. And when we obey, we come into contact with God's grace. It's not our actions that earn us a place in heaven. It's not our works that prove to God that we deserve to be saved. You see, we don't deserve to be saved. Romans chapter 3, verse 23, tell us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. We don't deserve salvation. But it's God's grace that allows us salvation. How do we find that salvation? Through obedient faith and on the other side of the water. If you've never become a Christian, if you want to make your life right tonight or this, this morning, I encourage you to do that. I encourage you to, to come forward in just a moment as we are going to stand and sing the song of invitation and to make known your desire to, obe- to be obedient and to demonstrate your obedient faith to God. At this point now, as we stand and sing, come to the front.